Mark 6. We're continuing our sermon series in Mark's Gospel. And for several weeks now, we've been looking at this part of Mark where it talks about the majesty of Christ as it's displayed in this Gospel. In Christ incarnate, we see a perfect picture of masculine authority in a man. Christ became man. Having become human flesh, he's in the place that really every human being, man or woman, male or female, occupies. Like us, he is the one who is in authority and also under authority at the same time. In authority and under authority at the same time. He has God the Father over him, and he has the people of this world under him. And he submits to God and rules over men at the same time. And in submitting to God, that includes submitting to those who are in authority over him. Like Jesus, for example, as a child, his parents had authority over him. And as a subject in the kingdom, the kings of the land or the governors had authority over him in that, in that regard. Not ultimate authority over him as the, as the risen reigning son of God, but as, as man, he was here subject to those just as we are. And that's part of being subject to God, that we're subject to those who are God's ministers. So in Christ, we see this, this perfect submission to those over him and perfect leadership in those that he is over. It's the way of masculine perfection. And by masculine, I'm talking about when you're in the place of leadership. The, the character of one's masculine authority is most clearly seen in those who have the most authority. A father in the home, the elders in the church, kings and magistrates in the land. But it's also seen in a three-year-old little girl who is the, in the masculine place of authority over her one-year-old brother. Put someone in charge and you see what they're really like. You may see opposite errors in their leadership. You see tyranny and excessive control on the one hand, or you see the opposite error, neglect and irresponsibility on the other hand. In one case, they're controlling every detail in an oppressive way. In the other case, they're indifferent, they don't care. They want nothing to do with it. But you may also see when someone is put in an authority, true godliness. Where authority is exercised with full recognition that all authority is from God. And where it is exercised as an extension of God's gracious rule rather than as a selfish control of other people. Where the authority is exercised for the benefit of those that are under it, rather than the benefit of the one who is in authority. In Jesus, we see masculine authority exercised in beautiful perfection. His authority is exercised by giving Himself to redeem those that are under His care because of their need. He spares nothing. He does this even though it cost him that which is most precious to him. He gave up his righteous standing with the Father, which was most precious to him, to become sin for us, to bear our sins, to be our sin bearer on the cross. He does this, did this, both in obedience to the Father and in loving mercy to us. As our King, he commands us and he corrects us but His commands and corrections are never arbitrary or selfish, but designed to restore to us the beautiful place of full submission to God that He occupies and that He leads us into by His redemptive grace. We come under God's loving care and are able then to exercise that care in our relationships. What a beautiful place the new heaven and the new earth will be in which we we who are, who are now will all be in the proper place that God has given us with God over us and those who we serve, that we care for them and serve them in, in the way that uh, God has called us to 
as an extension of him. We need to learn about authority in our day because there is a masculine mess in our world. Disaster, really. We're a society that has sought to remove authority because so many of us have been hurt by those in authority. But as with our revolutions, we overthrow established authority only to find ourselves under even worse authority than the authority that we cast off. That's what always happens in a revolution. You get rid of some aristocrats or whatever that were selfishly leading indeed, and then you get a dictator that selfishly leads even worse, even more. Uh, That's what happens. Many young men and old men, for that matter, know nothing about how to lead in a godly way and often do not even try, but are easily shut down because of our society's perception that authority is always a bad thing because the most that we've ever seen is authority that either doesn't care or authority that is oppressive. There is another way. In our text today, though, we're going to look at the pathetic authority that we see in King Herod Antipas. As I mentioned before, put a man in a high position and you see the true character of his masculinity for good or for bad. In looking at Herod Antipas' negative example, we will see the beauty of Christ in contrast to that. And we will feel the call of God to come to Christ as the right kind of leader that we may be redeemed by Him so that we may be forgiven for our selfish tyranny and also be forgiven as those who desire to become like Him, to be, to be helped as those who desire to one day be like Him. Our scripture reading will begin this morning in Mark 6, 6b, chapter 6, verse 6, in the middle of the verse, and continue to verse 30. My primary preaching text, though, will be from 6, 14 through 29. If you were here last week, you'll recall that Mark inserts this account about Herod and his account about the first mission that Jesus sent his disciples on, the 12 disciples. As we shall see, the multiplication of Christ's ministry by sending out the 12 to preach, heal, and expel demons got Herod's attention. That's why it's inserted in the middle of their mission. Herod saw that the popularity of Christ was increasing and he was unnerved. So that's why Mark sticks it in the history at this point and tells us what Herod had done to John the Baptist and why he was afraid and why he was in a certain way, in his vacillating way, opposed to Christ and yet also intrigued. So listen as I read this passage to you beginning in Mark 6, verse 6, in the middle of the verse. Then he went about the villages in a circuit, teaching. And he called the twelve to himself and began to send them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper in their money belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. Also, he said to them, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place. And whoever will not receive you nor hear you when you depart from that place, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So they went out and preached that the people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Now King Herod heard of him, for his name had become well known. And he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. Others said, It is Elijah. And others said, It is the prophet, or like one of the prophets. But when Herod heard, he said, This is John whom I beheaded. He has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John, and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Therefore Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, 
knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Then an opportune day came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a feast for his nobles, the high officers and the chief men of Galilee. And when Herodias' daughter herself came in and danced and pleased Herod and those who sat with him, the king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you want, and I will give it to you. He also swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. So she went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. Immediately she came in with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. Yet because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took away his corpse and laid it in a tomb. Then the apostles gathered to Jesus, told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy and infallible word. This morning, we will consider three things about pathetic authority. The masculine mess that we see far more of in our society, in our own lives, than we would desire. First, pathetic authority fears God just enough to be tormented. Miserable condition. You know enough about God to be actually terrified by Him because of your sin, but you don't fear Him enough to come to Him to be reconciled. Try as you might to avoid the knowledge of Him, it has a way of resurfacing, of coming to haunt you. You try to drown it, the knowledge of God. You try to forget it. You try to do things to calm your conscience, but it continues to emerge again and again. And it will keep on doing so until the day that you either accept that God does have authority over you and yield to Him through Christ, or that you meet Him in judgment and receive the full punishment for your sins that will continue forever and ever. How grand it is for those who finally make peace with God as the God to whom you owe all things and who receive His full provision for their restoration through Christ. It's a, it's a, a tremendous relief to those who live in this torment of knowing that there is a God trying to push that away, refusing to be reconciled. When we come in Christ, there is freedom, there is, there is liberty. It's a tremendous thing. But how torturous it is to go on in this miserable state of rebellion against the living God, knowing that God is a judge and yet not fearing Him enough to actually repent and turn to Him. Let's look at Herod's example as the one who remained under this torment. In verse 14 through 17, we see him haunted, haunted by the rising popularity of Christ. It might have been very different for him. He might have seen Christ going about with his disciples doing good for the people that were in Galilee and uh, around his dominion, that he Herod's dominion, you see him casting out demons and seeing him healing people and preaching reconciliation to God through the cleansing that he was going to provide. Truly a message of glorious hope that God has come in mercy to redeem his people, to restore them. That might have been an occasion for great joy for him, that God had visited his people with his promised mercy in David. But instead, all this is a source of excessive anxiety for him. He is haunted because of his guilty conscience. He has not repented. He concludes, as verse 16 says, that this is John whom I beheaded. He has been raised from the dead. He thinks that John the Baptist has come back with renewed powers now. And all it means for him is terror of conscience for unjustly killing a righteous man. 
we see this same torment of fear in Herod, not only in how he reacts here when Christ rises in popularity, but we also see it in how he interacted with John in the history that he is recounted here of his engagement with John while John was still alive. We're told of this in verse 20. It says, see, see how very familiar this sort of thing is. It says, for Herod feared John. Now remember, John represented God, of course, as a prophet of God. He feared John knowing that he was a just and holy man and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. The fear that Herod had of John was a fear of God that, uh, because Herod knew that, that John was from God. John's boldness unnerved Herod because he didn't have that kind of boldness. It also attracted him. How could this man stand before someone who had the power to kill him and speak boldly, telling him exactly what was true? Here was a man that was not afraid of men, a man who did not vacillate and weigh out everything that he said the way Herod did to see what the polls would say and what response the powerful people would have to it and all this, but a man who boldly and plainly spoke the truth. Herod tried to find a middle ground, a compromise with his guilty conscience to ease himself. Yes, he had imprisoned John, but, but look at this. His wife wanted John to be killed, and Herod was protecting him. Right? He, he's, he's a good guy, right? Because he had imprisoned him, but, but he didn't kill him like his, his wife wanted to. He was like you are when you're guilty and you do something good. You know, it, it was, see, see, I'm not so bad after all. Look what I did. I may have put John in prison unjustly, but I'm protecting him. I'm not so bad. You're like the thief that boasts of his generosity. You know, he robs a bunch of people and then he's really generous with, with the little children or something, giving them toys or something. And he says, see, see, I'm really a good guy. I'm a good heart. I give, I give toys to children. All the stuff that I stole from people, I'm using in a good way. Or, or the adulterer who buys flowers for his wife. See what a good husband I am? You know, I, I buy flower, I bought flowers for my wife. You see how it says that Herod, hearing John, did many things. Now there's a manuscript difference. Some of you might have where it says... Uh, uh, something, something different there, but I'll go with what it says in, uh, in the majority text. Uh, he, he actually submitted to some of John's preaching is what this would suggest. Perhaps he was working on his temper or something. You know, his fear of God led him to do so. And he listened to John's preaching. That's, that's very clear. Didn't that show that, you know, he was not as bad as it might seem? He, he listened to the righteous preacher. He went and sat under his preaching. But there was no repentance. There was no true yielding to God. There was a superficial yielding in many things, but there wasn't a real yielding. You know how people that haven't repented will go to church, and they'll give to charity, and they'll even read their Bibles, whatever, but without ever really turning to God as their God. They never really come to Christ who alone can restore them cleansing by Him. Through cleansing by Him, it's, it's, uh, the, the cleansing that He brings is more cleansing than they want. I don't want to be cleansed that much. I want, I want to keep these things, but, but I'll, I'll, give them the, I'll turn these things. So that, that's where they come from. So, so the tormented conscience continues because they fear God, but they don't fear Him enough. To actually come to Christ to be cleansed. And then there is this beheading of John. And how, tor how tortured Herod is in, in that event. He fears God enough that he's filled with extreme sorrow when his daughter, his stepdaughter, tells him that she wants the head of John the Baptist and he's promised to give her what she wants. But there's not enough fear of God to keep him from actually doing it. There's enough fear to make him distressed. He's in a position where he, he feels like he has no choice. Of course he did. Look at verse 26. The king was exceedingly sorrow, sorry. Yet because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he didn't want to refuse her. You see the way that kings would do sometimes in the... They, they would promise to... 
someone that, you know, I'll give you whatever you want. See how generous I am? I'll give you up to half my kingdom. You know, it was an exact. She knew that he wouldn't really give her half the kingdom. He didn't even have a kingdom to give because he was under the Roman authority ultimately. But it was, it was an exaggerated way of saying, hey, you asked me for something big because I want to show off to all these people how generous I am and how pleased I am with what you did. And it was a way of pride, you see. And so because he had made these oaths that I will give you anything you want up to half my kingdom, and his friends were all there, all the big wigs were there that for his birthday, then he said, oh, I, I, I can't get out of this. I'm trapped. I've got it. I don't want to do this, but I've got to do this. He was tormented. If you do the will of God, you don't have to be tormented about what to do. You just go ahead and do the right thing. And then you don't have to worry about all the decision and what's going to happen if I do this and how will I look and what will people think and what might the implications be. Just, just do what God called you to do. It's, it's really quite simple in that regard. Now I'll have more to say about this later, but for now just see that the beheading of John is a thing that caused the, the, the ministry of Christ in Galilee to haunt him rather than bring him hope and joy. See how it affected him? Because he was carrying this about what he had done. Then now when Christ comes, he can't rejoice in Christ. It's like, oh, that's John. That's John the Baptist. He's tormented. This king, this man that's supposed to have authority over this land. So how does the ministry of Christ fit with you? Is the ministry of Christ something that makes you uneasy? And afraid? Or is the ministry of Christ something that gives you hope and joy and encouragement? It depends on whether you have come to him for cleansing or not. If you've repented, that was the message of Christ, the message of John the Baptist. Repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent because he's here to cleanse you. If you don't want to be cleansed, of course you don't repent. Say, well, I'll repent of these things. I'll come and get cleansing for this stuff. But, but no, I'm going to hold it. No, it's, it's your call to, all of you, you're called to repent. At the bottom, you, know, you have here an authority in Herod that never finds its rightful place under the authority of God. It remains as an autonomous authority that is detached from God. You need to understand that all authority is from God. It is never your own rule that you're to exercise as a parent or a church leader, or a manager at work, or in the government. It is always his rule in every sphere, and you either represent him well, or you misrepresent him. But you're always representing him, because your authority is God-given in whatever place you have. When authority is exercised apart from God, even in defiance of his will, it is authority that makes you guilty. Because you are in the place of God and you misrepresented God. What we sang in Psalm 82. It is His authority and you're misusing it. Like a child that's given money to go and purchase something and instead uses the money to buy a toy or something. It's truly a torturous thing to be short of repentance before God. To never really yield to Him. To always be holding back from truly coming to Christ. To know that you have crossed Him and that you will be judged, but to go on misusing your authority and adding more guilt to your account. It's the miserable condition of those described in Romans 1.32, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that these are people who had sunk deep, deep into their sin and had a reprobate mind, and yet it says of them, Romans 1.32, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, they know that. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. They keep doing wrong and they encourage others to do wrong. Such is the condition of those who are outside Christ. They find no rest until they repent or when the day of judgment comes and they receive the opposite of rest. But what a relief it is. Say again, to the soul that finally comes to Jesus Christ. What's the purpose of this resistance to God? What's the purpose of it? It makes no sense whatsoever. Come to Him. 
He is there to cleanse. He is there to reconcile you to God. You don't have to come with a, a, a pristine record. You come as somebody that wants to be cleansed from all of your sin. So that's the first thing then what we see with pathetic authority. It fears God enough to be tormented, but not enough to come to Christ and find its proper place before God. There's more I want to say about this pathetic authority. Second, pathetic authority is unable to rule over its own passions. Some of the most powerful men in the world have been men who were never able to control their own passions. They're able to conquer kingdoms, but they're never able to conquer themselves. Instead of following Christ, they follow their own passions and desires. Their lust has a death hold on them from which they cannot escape. Though let me say again, were they to come to Christ, He would set them free. Not that they might, may not have to fight in this life against their lusts, but that they will be in the fight. Sometimes they may fall, but they will be able to escape the snare and find cleansing and forgiveness and return to the Lord wholeheartedly and go on with Him, going on with the Lord. How weak men groan can, can, under, this, under this burden. We see men that uh, they have some men of power that have some passion and some corruption that they can't escape. J- just think of the, the, the crack addict or the, or the drunkard or the porn user or the angry man that can't put away his anger, the child molester, the adulterer, the sodomite, the spendthrift, the liar, the cheat. They will tell you of the power of sin. But who needs them to tell you the power of sin? You know all about it. You know about the power of sin in your own life. But Christ gives us true repentance and He keeps us so that sin cannot have dominion over us. Look at Herod in our text. A man driven by sexual lust. This king with all his authority. By the way, he wasn't really a king, but he's called a king. He had a kind of authority, but he was, again, under the authority of other men. But he was in a place of of supreme leadership. And this king, with all his authority, could not conquer this sin, sexual immorality. No man, no matter how great his earthly authority may be, can conquer his own sin. Look at how Herod's lust controlled him, verse 17. He said, For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. And here's the key part. For he had married her. He married his brother's wife. His brother's wife. This brother that, of his name, named Philip, who had been disinherited by Herod the Great, their, their father, and who had gone to Rome and lived there as a private citizen. We know this from history books and was married to this woman Herodias and had a daughter named Salome. And Herod Antipas, the Herod of our text, they were all called Herod. They have different, you know, Herod names. But um, the, the Herod of our text, Antipas, had gone to visit Philip, his brother. And though Herod himself, uh, Herod Antipas, was a married man, he was infatuated with Philip's beautiful wife. And she was a woman of ambition who thought that it would advance her to be married to someone who was the Tetrarch of Galilee. So she agreed to divorce her husband Philip and marry Herod Antipas if he would divorce his wife and have her alone. She didn't want a polygamous uh, situation. So it was done. This was an act not of sound judgment, but of sheer lust. It was even bad policy because the wife that he divorced was the daughter of the Nabatean king, Artis IV. You make an alliance with the nation when you marry their daughter like that. And this king, Artis, later sent troops to punish Herod for humiliating his daughter. And they did a good job of it. And this made Herod displeasing to his superiors in Rome later on. It was also bad policy for his subjects in Galilee and Samaria. 
because God's law to Christ. Now, of course, when I say bring it to Christ, Christ had not yet been crucified or raised when he did this. But I mean by that, that Herod would not bring this sin to Christ in the way that things were brought to Christ before Christ went to the cross. By repenting and looking to God for cleansing. Same thing we do now, but they looked to it then as it was typified by the blood of the covenant shed on the altar at the temple. Now we know that Christ has come and fulfilled what was required and we look to him, what they were waiting for in the Old Testament. So by looking to Christ, see, that was what the call was, what the message of, of John the Baptist and of Jesus as he went about before he was crucified, that cleansing is coming. So repent, repent of your sin and posture yourself for cleansing. Come to God for cleansing. They could even be cleansed then. They could be forgiven then when they, when they believed and repented. But the cleansing that was going to happen was going to happen through Christ on the cross. Though Herod, as we already knew, knew that John was a just and holy man and heard him preach with gladness, doing many things, his lust for Herodias had such a hold on him that he would not bring this sin to Christ. He would not repent. Instead of repenting of his sin and giving Herodias up, Herod had sent, verse 17, and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias. Verse 18, because John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. That's John's boldness speaking to kings. Therefore, Herodias had it in for him and wanted to kill him, but she could not because Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man and he protected him. Herod would not kill John, but neither would he repent. Though a king, his lust is the thing that had the mastery of him and kept him in this middle position between repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and holding on to this wife that was an unlawful union. And in our text, we see Herod's lust also regarding his own stepdaughter, Herodias' daughter, whose name is Salome. Fathers, and stepfathers for that matter, are meant to protect their daughter's chastity, and to do it in love, to guard them from the kind of relationship that Herod had with Herodias, an unlawful attachment from a relationship that could not be blessed of God. Some fathers do very little to guard their daughters from such things, to help them dress in modest and not sensual apparel. Fathers who are full of lust in their own heart find glory in their daughters' immodesty. Herod truly takes the cake here. That's, that's awful, isn't it? Finding glory in their daughter's immodesty. Herod takes the cake here with his stepdaughter. Having his daughter come and dance before a room full of nobles and military leaders and the big brass of the land, he has his daughter come in and dance. He allows this. This was a dance that was usually for only immoral women to do. Women who are prostitutes, not for king's daughters. A pantomime that ended with the dancer naked. How disgusting that Herod seems to be the one that's the most pleased of all at this spectacle. As a father, he should have used his authority to protect his daughter. But instead, he used it to exploit her. And to please himself, he used it as a predator. I ask the men here who have daughters, where are you in your daughter's life? Are you providing the kind of godly maturity that will enable her to wait for a godly man? Or are you leaving her with a hunger for attention that will cause her to run after the wrong kind of attention? In our pride, we might say that it is hard to believe that any father would do what Herod did. But if you know your own heart, I ask you, is it really that hard to believe? Shamefully, it's not so hard to believe. How many men have been dominated and are dominated by sexual lust? How many kings and ministers and fathers have been ruined by it as kings and ministers and fathers and brought their household to ruin by it? Drunkenness has slain its thousands, but sexual lust its ten thousands. 
It is one of the primary ways that contempt for God is shown by a human being. Often the drive is not just for the sin itself, but for the pride of expressing autonomy and displeasure with God. It is often committed by men who are unhappy with God or when they're unhappy with God, who are full of self-pity and want to exert their independence in pride that God can't tell me what to do, that God can't forbid this to me. But as with all sins, the great problem is not merely in committing this sin, but the even greater problem is in refusing to bring it to Christ. There's a great difference in a man who struggles with sin but is humbled like David was and repents and a man who brings it to Christ to be cleansed from his guilt and from the power that it has over him and the man that harbors this sin, that protects it and guards it and never brings it to Christ that he might die to his sin. This is the way of Herod. What a trade-off. His lust held on to and Christ rejected and proper leadership of his kingdom and his family, impossible. This is the way of Herod. Such offers and powerful appeals he had from John. John was preaching repentance. And he would not hear. He would not come to be cleansed by the redemptive mercy of God that was being displayed at this very time in the world. I might mention that this sin led even to the ruin of Herodias and Herod in this life. Herod, as I mentioned already, stirred up war with the Nebatian king Artus and then had the audacity at the prompting of Herodias to ask Emperor Gaius Caligula that he might be given given fortunes equal to his brother Herod Agrippa I. And what did he receive when he asked Caligula for that, he was banished to Gaul with Herodias. He died as a man that was banished, that lost his kingdom, because he had this woman in his sexual lust that controlled him. What pathetic authority. A man that's controlled by his own lust, sinful lust. What a masculine mess. What pathetic authority. Here is a ruler that like so many rulers does not acknowledge that his authority from God is from God. And here is a ruler who with authority over other people has no authority over himself. How he needed Christ. How we all need Christ. And now let's look at a third characteristic of a pathetic authority. Third, pathetic authority is easily manipulated by those under it. We saw that with King Ahab, didn't we? Let me explain. When a man knows that his authority is from the Lord, he is not easy to manipulate. He leads whatever is under him as the Lord's emissary. He is steadfast and solid because his commitment is to do the will of God. If he is a leader in business, he is there for the glory of God, to lead those under his authority to serve others. He is there for God. He will not work on the Lord's day. He will tithe all of his increase. He will not misrepresent his product or his services to get an advantage. He will deal fairly because he is there for God. He is not there for just what he can gain. Try as you might, you can't entice him to deceive or to cheat. If he is a leader of a family, he knows that his authority in his home is for the glory of God. He will execute godly discipline correcting ungodliness, not as a tyrant, but as a loving leader who knows that he stands in need of God's grace too. Very different, isn't it? When you correct others knowing that you stand in need of grace or when you correct them because they irritated you and you can't believe that they did something that that you know you would do the same thing. You see, he he goes to them with firmness of one who is representing the Lord and the love of one who knows that God's ways are for the good of his family. He will manage his family's finances, not by giving in to every whim, and certainly not by selfishly indulging in his own toys and pleasures, but by responsible spending, investing and faithful sharing, enjoying God's gifts, but not robbing from God or overextending. 
He will lead his family in regular prayer and family worship, teaching them God's word and helping them apply it, teaching them to call on the Lord in their distress, leading them to confess their sins before God by doing that himself and calling them to do so when in need, taking the responsibility to bring them to a sound church, even if they don't want to go to a sound church, if they want to go to one that's weak and compromising. He will do this for his family. He will stay in touch with his children and with his wife. He will know the state of their soul. He will talk to them. He will talk to his children and draw them out and understand where they are. Because he's a man that is leading his family for God. Not a man who is leading his family for himself. If he is a leader in the community or the nation, he will also see that his authority is an extension of God's authority in that realm. And he will minister to his constituents. His decisions will not be based on the polls, but on what pleases the Lord and what is true to God's word. The question will not be whether the people want abortion, but whether God approves of abortion. People can come with bribes and threats, but a godly leader will not be moved by any of these. If he is not able to lead because of his godly views, he won't won't lead in that society. He will take a humble place until that society is changed. People can come with all sorts of things, but he will not be moved. He is, a much, he is much more concerned about what the Lord thinks than he is about exploiting his office for his own, own gain or, or for his own glory. He's more concerned about serving the Lord and honoring him. To him, to lose favor with God is much worse than to lose a bribe or protect himself from a threat. A godly man will not be manipulated by those under his authority. He knows who appointed him to lead. He is there for God. Think of our Lord Jesus Christ in this matter. His mother and his brothers came to him supposing that he was deranged and he would not listen to them. He would not be manipulated. He insisted that his real mother and brothers and sisters were those who did the will of God. That's real authority. His own disciples tried to dissuade him from going to the cross, but he would not be manipulated by them. He refused to listen to a bit of it, but insisted that he had come from heaven to do his father's will, not his own will, and that it was his father's will for him to go to the cross. He would not be manipulated by those that were under him. But Herod, who had more authority given to him than most men, was this poor, vacillating wimp who is easily controlled by his wife and by his daughter. He knew that what Salome had requested was evil. He knew that John was a godly man. He knew that John did not deserve to die. He knew that his wife was wrong to have his daughter ask him for John's head. I told you that we would come back to verse 26, where having been asked for John's head on a platter by two women with such hateful malice, We read from verse 26, And the king was exceedingly sorry, yet because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. He knew how wrong it was, and he was exceedingly sorry about it, but he did not have the masculine strength to say no. So he gave in to them. Immediately, verse 27 says, The king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought, and he went and beheaded him in prison brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl and the girl gave it to her mother. He was weak because he had already severed himself from God. He had no moral fiber in him. By refusing to repent of his sinful marriage because of his lust, he was weak. He did not have the grace of God. By having his daughter dance before him and his nobles, he was weak. He had no moral integrity. How could he have the moral strength to say no to his wife and daughter when he himself was not living for God? He was not representing God. How could he call them to live for Christ when he was not living for Christ? Men who try to do this when they are, uh, when, when they are following their own sins come off as harsh and, and come off as, as uh, irritated in their calls to repentance. Often they just pull away and do nothing. They they will not speak into the lives of others with authority because they cannot. Here's a test by which you can see if you really are in Christ. Question. 
does Christ have real authority in your life? He has real authority in the lives of those that He has redeemed. You see, He's not like that father that doesn't speak into his children's life or that minister that does not speak the truth of God or that civil authority that does not do the will of God. If you are truly in Him for eternal life, He is speaking authority into your life and you are following Him. He said as much in John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. They may sin, but He corrects them and rescues them and restores them and does not let them continue in their rebellion because He is faithful. We are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation. That's why in the first epistle of John, John says that if someone does reject him and go away from him, he never really knew him in the first place. He didn't have a saving relationship. He may have known him in a superficial way like Herod did and done many things, but he did not repent and give himself to be cleansed by Christ. If you're not hearing his voice, then there is only one thing to do. If you look at yourself and you say, I am not really hearing the authority of Christ. I am not responding. You need to repent and you need to come to Him to wash you from your sin. He died on the cross so that by faith in Him we could be forgiven. And when He receives us, He becomes our Lord and there is no manipulation of Him. You don't manipulate Christ. We have seen what His authority does. It is an authority that expels demons. It's an authority that cleanses lepers, heals the sick, and raises the dead. And it is an authority that brings sinners to repentance, that secures their forgiveness, and gives them eternal life in which they serve God and their neighbor. You can continue to flounder about in your sin with terror like Herod did, or you can come to Christ and be saved and restored to the Father. Then you will be able to lead others as well. Please stand. Gracious Heavenly Father, we see that there is a great weakness in masculine authority today. And we see in your word the reason. Here is a man that was a king, and yet he had no real proper authority. He did not have authority that was attached to you because he was not reconciled to you. He had never come to repent of his sins and to receive the cleansing that you so graciously give to those who call on your name. Lord, I pray that you would have mercy on all of us. Father, perhaps there are those here who have only repented in a superficial way or who have not even done that. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would have mercy upon them and that you would call them with your powerful authoritative call that, that breaks sinners and, and that brings them to repentance. We know that Christ said, that all of his sheep will hear his voice and that he will gather them and that they will follow him. And we pray, O oh Lord, that your voice would go out with power and authority in the world, that through us preaching and through people preaching all over the world, that the sound of the gospel would be heard and that many would come and receive the salvation that you have promised. Father, we praise you and we thank you for that powerful work of grace that, that transforms sinners and that that brings them reconciliation. Oh Lord, help us then, if we have been reconciled, to also walk with you. We thank you, Lord, that when we go astray, that we hear the authoritative voice of Christ come and speak into our lives, that he deals with us, that he does not let us go on to ruin, that no temptation has taken us but what is common to man, that, that you are faithful and will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we're able so that we go to utter ruin, but you will provide the way of escape so that we may be able to bear it. We thank you, O oh Lord, for the hope that we have. And we pray, Lord, that even if we have committed sin as grievous as David did, that we would, as David, come confessing our sin and repenting of it in truth, because we are under your rule, not like, the, not like Herod, who, though he sinned, though he knew he did wrong, did not come, did not come for cleansing and continued on in his vacillating way. Oh, Father, have mercy on us. Help us to lead in a godly way. Not, there's so much misunderstanding about leadership, about headship, and about how it's supposed to be exercised. 
Oh, Father, we pray that you would transform our whole society. It has become very confused about these things. We pray, Lord, that there would be beauty of, of, of leadership in our churches, Lord. It's so often not the case. Father, we confess to you that it's not so with us. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, and that you would change us so that we could grow into what you have called us to be and that we could, be, we, we, we could shine, Lord, according to the, the light that you have called us to be in this world. We ask you for your mercy. We pray, Lord, that you would send us forth seeking Christ and rejoicing in Christ. And we pray that you would bless us as we prepare now to come to the Lord's table. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.